Welcome everyone, Kostin here with a discussion about the dwarves, or as I'm going to refer them throughout this entire video, the dwarves. I'm sure the vast majority of players don't really care about it either way. But regardless, the dwarves are a race that's overall fairly weak in Warhammer 3, largely due to the fact that they only got one pay DLC and then a free DLC for Warhammer 2 that mainly changed things with their grudges and their fort system, but did not tackle their economy, their growth, their public order, their insanely bloated research tree, or any of that. So in this video, I do want to talk about how to play a campaign as dwarves. What are your best options? Because it's quite likely we are not going to see any kind of buffs or major changes to dwarves, at least until next year. Hopefully when the Chaos Dwarf DLC comes out. If we got changes earlier than that, that would be excellent, but I don't necessarily expect it. What are the issues? Well, they have issues with control, potentially, because of the grudge system. They have issues of growth, they have issues with their economy, they have issues with being able to recruit units. The only saving grace that the dwarves do have is that they have a pretty good army available to them. They have some pretty decent heroes with some amazing army buffs, in particular the runesmiths can add a lot. Good artillery. Um, and benefits in auto-resolve as well, provided you have a decent army to work with. But they do get benefits in auto-resolve in the defensive, on the offensive. The game does like units with high leadership, high armor, and the dwarves certainly do excel in those kind of uh, departments. So, they are a race that you, if you can get going, you can start doing very well, but it's getting going that's going to be the problem. The growth issue, the control public order issue because of the grudges, as well as the lack of replenishment are all going to bite you in the ass. You don't have a hero to help you replenishment, and the only structure that you do have is the one associated with growth, and it gives you a meager 5% at tier 4. Needless to say, your armies on the field are generally not gonna get this structure. Hell, they might not even get the tier 1 or tier 2 version of the structure, and there's gonna be a lot of problems. Now, to understand the growth issue, you need to understand uh, two things. One, the grudges, the grudge meter, if it goes too high, will affect your control. And generally speaking, when, when you're playing on a higher difficulty level, you're going to get minus eight on legendary, or I believe this applies on very hard. I haven't played on any other difficulty besides the legendary campaign difficulty for a very, very long time, so I don't even remember how it is on very hard. I think it's eight or four. Either way, no, I think 4 is minus 4 is on hard. By the way, you're going to be at a uh, control disadvantage. And the thing is, the dwarf main settlements, which the main settlements are generally a big generator of growth, the main settlements only generate either 5 or 7, 10. And this is for the capitals. It is a pr p pathetic situation when it comes to the growth of dwarves. Now, they do have some ways of making up for it, but one of the things that does hamper them is that poor control, which you are certainly going to have. You're not generally going to get rebellions. Very rarely do you get rebellions, but what does happen a lot of the time is you end up in situations where you're losing growth, where you can basically be at growth zero, essentially, because you're losing too much growth, um, too much growth because of the poor control. Like, at Insecure, it's minus 10, at Wavering, minus 15, and going all the way to minus 20. That can be a problem, especially when you have, especially early on, when, you're, when you have low-tier settlements that only generate 5 uh, growth each or 7 growth each, that can be an issue. And without these structures of the granary, basically the bakers, without them, you're just not going to have enough growth to be able to get your settlements, which means in turn you're not going to be able to get the structures for unit recruitment. This is, by the way, something. The only structures that give any decent, the only capitals that give decent uh, amount of growth are the, like the special uh, dwarven cities, like their capital of Karazakarak, 
that kind of stuff. Uh, the other ones just generate a very insignificant amount of uh, growth. Karak Apex, Karak Zakarak, Karak Adren. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to have really, really poor growth. You do have some tools to deal with it, but you're going to have to rely on quite a lot of these barley fields to be able to make do, as well as commandments to make do. You do have the commandment of empowering the guilds. Now, by default, this is 15 for Forgrim, who gets better commandments for Forgrim and Karazakarak. It's 20 by default. You can get that up to 30 with research, 40 for Forgrim, meaning Forgrim can go, grow his settlements much faster than the other uh, Dwarven uh, legendary lords, if you're playing him. I bring but yes, it is an issue. And it's an issue compounded by the grudge system, which may affect your control. Now, with patch 2.2, what's happened to the grudge system is that no longer will it get to absurd, ridiculous levels. In point of fact, I started with a very low grudge level. I believe I was actually satisfied, if I'm not mistaken, from the very start. And it hasn't gone up ever since, pretty much. And right now, I've dealt with all my grudges. There were quite a few to deal with, but I was able to do it by turn 43. But it never was an issue. This was a major problem before the release of patch 4.3. So, that's uh, those are some of the issues that the dwarves will have. The benefits, of course, are heroes like runes, uh, Master Engineers, Runesmith, Fanes, the powerful army. So, how do you overcome that? Well, first off, we need to talk about research. And research-wise, here's what I'm going to say. There are many paths over here, but only some are absolutely worth uh, taking. As far as I'm concerned, much of this is pointless, worthless, just trying to show off that, oh, the dwarves have a lot of research. Yeah, but a lot of it is pretty crap, to be honest. And there's quite a lot of other races that have much, much of the effects that dwarves may have in two, three, maybe even more research um, that they have those effects in a single research, um, re research option. But here's the thing that you need to understand research-wise. Because growth is intrinsically tied to control, you want to increase that. The best way to do that is to get the High King authority. Now, dependent on how many grudges you're going to have at the start of your campaign and how that's going to affect the grudge meter, whether or not you'll, you'll be at a fairly low level, maybe even satisfied, or at a medium spot, uh, or even angry, where you start losing research rate, it might take 20 turns, in the best case scenario, 22 turns, to get the High King Authority. Now, the High King Authority gives you two control and 20 relations with dwarves. The relations with dwarves can help you with confederations, military alliances, etc. But the two control in itself is pretty worth it. But it's not just the two control. See, the thing about this particular research tree is everything you get along the way, because you get Oaths of Loyalty, which is another one control, and you need to get that before that. So that's 30 relations with all dwarves and free control. Then there's Autonomy of the Holds, making Empowered the, guild, uh, empowered the Guilds go from 15 growth to 30 growth. There's no argument in my mind that at least getting autonomy of the holds, if not the entire thing, is absolutely worth it at the beginning of every Dwarven campaign. Just the 15 growth alone is going to be worth it, but 15 growth combined with free control and 4, uh, four control actually in total when you add the first part of the research which is include related family, nepotism. So you're getting 4 control, 30 relations with dwarves, Master of Steel and Stone, which honestly is not really worth it as far as I see it, because most of the time, if you're running commandments as the dwarves, you're not going to be interested in anything other than empowering the guilds or venerate the ancestors, potentially. Master of Steel and Stone can help you out with uh, giving you more local recruitment capacity, but as far as I see it, it's not necessarily uh, worth it. Improving commandments can certainly be done with uh, certain... Uh, commandments like getting um, the Grand Throne uh, Chamber, which would take 12 turns at this point, potentially going for that. Could be worth it later on, especially as it gives you free uh, recruit rank, Lord recruit rank. But that's more of a late game benefit. 
early on, you are going to want to get the High King Authority. But once you get the High King Authority, what do you do next? Well, there are a number of choices. Some people will argue that going for militia training and improving your Dwarf Warriors can be worth it. Personally, I don't believe Dwarf Warriors are worth it all that much as units because although they're pretty good melee units, um, roster-wise you do have other options. And I do feel that there's certain, certainly some benefits in, um, in ignoring Dwarf Warriors completely or getting so many that so few that um, bothering with re the street search may not be worth it. Though you certainly can do it pretty decently fast within four turns, for instance, for me at the moment, and I don't really have a lot of research benefits right now. Though I do have some. I'll get into that in just a second. But instead, in the upper tree, you do have the heavy quernstones. Now, the two researches that the research points that you have to get, like tool market or Kazid subsidies, they're not really going to add a lot to your economy. It is fairly insignificant. However, 10 growth total combined with autonomy of the holds, combined with the commandment in, in itself, you're looking there at plus 40 growth in a province provided you can use empowering the guilds. This does mean that dwarves, if you're playing the dwarves, you do absolutely want to control the entire province more so than many other factions and that can cause some issues in some campaign in some parts of your campaign but even if you don't control the entire province you're still getting that extra 10 growth by default and that's worth quite a lot so hiking authority heavy corn stones whether or i would certainly recommend getting included related families the first thing regardless of your campaign and what you do after that whether or not you want to get the High King Authority first or the Heavy Cornstones, I would recommend getting both now, uh, them. Now, personally, I haven't really felt the need in my Belagar campaign to really focus, rush so much for the Heavy Cornstones. Because instead, what I've done is I went for High King Authority, I got control. Um, and because I've been playing a campaign with some mods, which I'll talk about at the end of this video, I didn't really need that extra growth. But if you're not playing on mods, you may want it. Mods that may affect your public order. But I'll get into that. Lower on, you do have the way of the clans. Now, in the way of the clans, here's what I'm going to... Uh, here, here's what I'm going to say when it comes to it. You, don't, uh, you have the melee tree and you have the range tree. Now, a lot of things, as I've mentioned before can be downright useless but there are some really nice pieces of research that you should absolutely get specifically this entire tree i would consider this as essential as you can get with most dwarven armies the first one gives you a recruitment cost that's not too important though it can obviously help you because it's quarrelers rangers and funders basically your main range all your main range units 20 percent ammunition for missile units this is amazing keeping our range units in the fight and then 15% reload time reductions for your rangers for your quarrelers and for your thunder ropes. basically all of your range units and then on top of that there's other research at the bottom 10% base missile damage for rangers 10% missile strength for quarrelers recruit rank for those range units and then eventually superior black powder once you start getting a good amount of thunderers they give you 10% missile strength for all thunder units this is absolutely worth it. So priority-wise, I would certainly say High King Authority. Then you have to decide what's more important. Do you want to improve your range units? I decided that I cared more about improving my range units than improving my growth at the point I was at in the campaign. But that's partly because of mods and partly because of Belagar's campaign structure where where, you do, where getting uh, your settlements to a high level isn't so important because you're not going to be able to recruit another, um, more than one or one and a half army until you get Karakate Peaks. Because if you do, you're just going to go bankrupt very quickly uh, if you try and mess around with recruiting too many units with plus 50% upkeep that Belagar has to deal with in his campaign. But research-wise, that's my that's priority I would go for. High King Authority, either Heavy Cornstones or Volley Fire, eventually Superior Black Powder, but what do you do after that? Well, there are a bunch of options, but as I've said, many of them are just 
pre worthless and don't, won't really add a lot. The Grand Front Chamber can be worth it. 12 turns to get 5% extra income and Lord Recruit rank. 12 turns from the Autonomy of the Hold. Uh, though keep in mind this is with some extra research uh, research benefits that I do have in this campaign, uh, certainly because of the, the Lords. Um, but that could... Um, the, but that could be worth it because you're you would get 10% income and eventually you are gonna stop needing either control or growth in settlements or you might get to a point where it doesn't really matter because once you get to tier 4 there's only two relatively unimportant benefits that you can get from tier 4 into tier 5 and that's getting more recruit rank your recruit rank and a bit of extra research with the Engineer's Guild Hall and the Rune Forge getting uh, extra global and local recruitment capacity, more of gold and hero recruit rank for runesmiths. But at that point, you might just say, yeah, screw it. I'm more interested in, uh, in having extra income, at, at, at least in certain provinces, though not necessarily in all uh, provinces. Just uh, worth saying what, when, when it comes down to it. Though, of course, you're generally going to want to get uh, settlements to tier 5, if only to get all of the um, slots available. All of the slots unlocked, so you can get more buildings, benefit your economy, benefit your faction in more ways. So it's still important to get to a higher level. Now, beyond that, here's my view on all of this. One of the key issues that the dwarves do have is uh, casualty replenishment. The way I see it when it comes to it, the one research that you should work with, uh, should work for, is getting Grimnir's favor. Now, this is going to take a lot of time. Make no mistake on that, right? And much of the research that you're getting along the way isn't going to be particularly great. However, the Recite Ancient Grudges gives you one extra local recruitment capacity, which in itself is pretty important. And then Grimmier's Favor gives you more as well as recruit rank. But you also get faction-wide 3% casualty replenishment, which is a pretty big deal. And while there are certainly some other things like your recruit ranks, corruption, etc., etc., um, I do believe that going down this tree, however long it's going to take you, is absolutely going to be worth it. You might get Gather the Throng, and it's at this point when you do decide to go for it that you might want to get Militia Training, or you could get Militia Training earlier if that's your fancy. But personally, as far as I see it, I use Dwarf Warriors only as a stop unit. Uh, unit. But now let's talk about Army Compositions and Lords. Now, army composition-wise, an army like this under Kazador the Dragon Slayer, because I did confederate Karakazul over here, an army like this is a very I as close to an ideal one that you're gonna get as the dwarves. At least for most of the game, when you start getting a super pow a powerhouse of an economy and you can afford more uh, higher tier units than just this, then you might want to change it around. But this is a quarreler heavy army, along with some regiments renowned, the hammer units that I started in Belagar's army, I transferred it over to Kazdor, decided that I wanted the slots there, Fane's uh, Master Engineer. Then I also have another army here, it doesn't have a Master Engineer, because capacity with Master Engineers can be a bit of an issue, you need tier 4 to start getting uh, the higher capacity for master engineers and it's begin. only one per tier four uh, per cell uh, per settlement also worth saying when it comes to that that the tier five one doesn't give you more on top of that i believe so um, i'm not sure if tier five is worth My anything anyway just extra uh, hero level or it might be i could be wrong on that Suffice it to say, I haven't played many campaigns where I could actually reliably get tier 5 settlement, uh, settlements for the dwarves. Generally, you tend to start winning the campaign before that. Some By the way, either an army like this or what Kazador has. Heavy, heavy on quarrelers. But why is that? Why not dwarf warriors? Quite a few people are using dwarf warriors. Well, here's my perspective with respect to that. While I think dwarf warriors are certainly good 
melee units. Quarrelers are better in a lot of situations. Unless you're ambushed in an ambush situation or you're fighting in narrow choke points, quarrelers are going to do much better in both siege battles and open field battlefields. They're really good range units that can do a lot of range damage. Like 41 missile strength is certainly on the higher end of things and they do have a good amount, a decent amount of armor piercing as well. The purpose of the grudge throwers is to tear down walls and tear down uh, uh, wall towers so they're not going to kill you. And then once you've done that in a siege, you can use your entire quarreler army to bombard the enemy uh, from outside the walls. It's the best way to fight sieges. It's tedious it as all hell, don't get me wrong on that, but it works. You can also benefit from having a master engineer. By the way, a point about quarrelers. While they are not as good in melee as dwarf warriors are, they can still hold their own pretty effectively in melee, um, either once the enemy has engaged you, or once they've expanded their ammunition. Though you can certainly keep their ammunition going uh, with a master engineer. Master engineers are the best heroes you have in your army as a result of that. But this is the kind of army that you want to use. Uh, the kind of army, the kind of crap stack, the term is crap stack, that you may want to get for around your empire. Though certainly some exceptions do exist. Over here to the north I have a different kind of army, though this is because I confederated Zulfbar, and they had a bunch of iron drakes and troll hammer torpedoes, and I decided, okay, fair enough, I'm not going to dismiss those units. I beat back some of Azag's armies, we've been having a little tussle over here, but I did record a bunch of quarrelers to supplement the warriors and uh, iron drakes. Yes. Or you can obviously rely on allied recruitment, more regiments are not, but yeah, still a core of quarrelers over there. Iron drakes are great units, don't get me wrong. They're great in sieges, they can do a lot of sam damage in siege battles, they can do a lot of damage in open field battlefields. Though you may not be able to recruit large numbers of them. And honestly, you shouldn't recruit a large number of them. Quarrelers and then Funderers and or maybe Bugman's Rangers in particular can form the core of your late game army. Like Bugman's Rangers, Funderers, some Iron Drakes, um, those can be useful. Uh, Bugman's Rangers in particular as opposed to regular Rangers or Rangers Grey Weapons because they've got regeneration. And on top of that, this is where we start talking about heroes. You also have the Fane hero, and this is where rangers start getting crazy when you consider the Fane hero with the Wanderer skill. Because the Wanderer skill gives snipe for all ranger units. What does snipe do? Well, what does it read? The unit remains hidden while firing. So all these guys can shoot at the enemy and the enemy won't see them. You can take down entire armies with these guys because they are invisible they've got pretty good range damage really good range damage um pretty good range decent amount of ammunition though not as much as quarrelers worth saying uh, with respect to that i think it's not as much as quarrelers uh, they can hold their own in a fight they've got good leadership though it's the bugman's rangers not the regular rangers they do require basically t for you to have um for you to have the ranger barracks uh, to be able to recruitment but it's not just the ranger barracks it's also the ranger barracks with the drinking hall uh, tier free so you need two buildings to be able to do that and given the issues that dwarves may have in terms of being able to get building slots in general because they're growth you may not be able to reliably recruit them that can be a bit of an issue in fact that as the dwarves if you're playing the dwarves, do get used to the idea that you may destroy structures. Like, you may build a structure just to recruit some units and then destroy them to get economic buildings. Certainly early on when you're trying to get grudge throwers, because grudge throwers only require a tier 2 building. So you build this, you get two free grudge throwers, or two grudge throwers, and then you get the regiment to run around later on. Um, so you have three, that's a pretty good number. Two or three is a pretty good number for the purposes of a siege. And then you don't care about them, so you destroy the artillery shop until your settlement is a much higher level and you can uh, reliably get better artillery. Especially if you can, once you start being able to get organ guns. Or even tier three, once, you, once you've set all the other things at tier three, it might be worth it. But tier three is going to be a journey that takes some time. 
Now, that's about the army. What about the heroes? What the, uh, what skills should you go for the heroes? I'm gonna go over all of them and then I'm gonna talk about the lords as well. Well, one of the things uh, to uh, to talk about when it comes um, when it comes to heroes, and yes, I'm using Belagar's ancestral spirits, though they have the same skill line. They just have a special trait uh, where they have 100% minus 100% upkeep, hero capacity for fanes over there. For the runesmith, uh, same uh, same deal, though hero capacity for a runesmith. So you basically get four free heroes that are stronger than others, and they they won't die. They're immortal. Okay, but with fanes, here's what I'm what I would say with fanes in general. What you want to focus the fanes on is their survivability, not their damage. Don't try and assume that these guys are going to be great in terms of da as damage dealers because they will not be. Um, now, Belagar's heroes do start with certain skills uh, for free, uh, but what you generally want to get is hard to hit, then some points in Deadly Blade, then unlock Foe Seeker, moving into Blade Shield and Scarred Veteran before getting Deadly Onslaught and Rune of Grimir. You don't care about uh, their charge bonus, you don't necessarily care about their weapon strength until much later on. Your priorities are to get them to be able to survive a lot of damage coming their way. So Blade Shield, Scarred Veteran, hard to hit. And then eventually you do buff them up with Deadly Onslaught, Woundmaker and all that, and Ancestral Garage. Another thing to say about the Fanes is one of your priorities should be to get training, because you're gonna need highly experienced units because you're gonna have issues recruiting units and maintaining more than one army. So getting training in general is a very uh, worthwhile skill. Also, the Dwarves are one of the very, very few races right now that I would say getting control as a priority, spreading control as a priority on your heroes is actually worth it. I can't say this for any other race because other races, yeah, you might suffer because of the loss of control, but you have enough growth to make up for it. Or you can get control from other sources. Dwarves may struggle with that. Yes, if you keep your grudge level at the lower at the lower level you will get free control and you get four from high king authority but your control building is tier two that wouldn't be a problem for most races who can get to tier two very quickly but the dwarves can't so getting that extra control from fanes is generally going to be worth it for you runesmiths well with runesmiths there's a bunch of useful skills i'd say sharpened weapons is generally better than hardened armor though because it's 5% miss missile damage, not just melee damage, um, if you buff that up. Though, you, I, based on how the screen looks, I don't know if you can get both scouting and sharpened weapons. And obviously, you, uh, you don't necessarily care about scouting those dwarves. However, just pointing out, because you can make items with oaf gold. Though, I'll talk about post-battle options in just a second. Um, when it comes to the runes with the runesmith... I would say the Rune of Wrath and Ruin is generally the most important one you can get early on. The damage this thing can do is ridiculous. You can blob blob the units, enemy units up. Hell, even if you're sending like just this guy with the Fane on the solo mission to blob the enemy army, and that's something that works as a very viable tactic when we're hammer free. Hide your army, send your heroes, blob them up, blob the enemy up, and use a Rune, the damage uh, that this... Uh, this is going to have is going to be extreme, especially if you overcast it. Beyond that, damping, always worth it to reduce winds of magic. Um, Rune of Oath and Steel, not really worth it. Maybe a point here, two points just to unlock a further on. Forge Fire, pretty important, reducing the armor of enemies. Armor is a fairly substantial, uh, has a fairly substantial effect in combat, so reducing it can help you out. And then you get to the runes over here. Now, these runes are actually fairly significant in their own right. The rune of hearth and home is, is the first one you want to get. Why is that? Because it gives you minus bigger per second, minus 5%. So you're basically, uh, you're basically benefiting the vigor of your army by a fairly substantial amount every second to allies in range, though it is a fairly short range of only 55 meters. Um, then you get rune. Then you get choices of rune of negation, rune of breaking. I don't generally use this that much. One thing to be said though is ward breaker is amazing because you're making enemy units far more vulnerable to missile fire. Then of then of course strike the runes. 
Um, but yeah, sharpened weapons, uh, I would argue, is worth it. Scouting, not necessarily so. Yeah, I wasted my points over here on this character. And of course, Rune of Grimir for Missile Resistance. And then finally, the Master Engineer. Uh, for the Master Engineer, the most important skill to get is increased mobility. Increased mobility gives you 15% movement range. Whenever you can spend a skill in it, spend the skill in it. It's the most important thing in your campaign to be able to get across the map very quickly. Beyond that, uh, the top skill tree over here is the most important one because you get 20%. This is just as much as the research, triangulation, 12% missile strength. Uh, then you get 15% missile sp uh, speed for uh, or speed for all missile units. Pretty important for dwarves who don't have the fastest units. And then, of course, the of bar 12 pounders. Not too significant. Then you have a choice between Deadeye and Grudge Raker. Here's how I view it. If you're expecting a Ranger or a Range Lord to do any actual damage in a battle, be prepared to be disappointed. So you're getting either skill for whatever benefits he provides to your army. From my personal perspective, you get the trade-off between Fear and the Cinder Blast uh, Shell versus Ballistic Calibration. Now, causing Fear in an enemy army is not something that should be ignored. Though, of course, you have to get this guy closer to, to the enemy line. Whereas if you go with Ballistic cal Calibration, you can buff a significant portion of your, uh, or a, a decent portion of your range line uh, by just using this particular skill. So is that particular trade-off? Generally, I go for that I, if I could have two engineers in army, I would, because being able to strike fear. Though, you do have some options uh, available if you do uh, want to strike fear in the hearts of your enemy, like certain runes, like Rune of Fear, uh, for instance, could work uh, instead. Just bear in mind, you, you're not going to be lacking for items if you're playing the dwarves. And then finally, let's talk about the lords themselves. What skill line should you go for? Well, for every legendary lord, one of the things you want to do is obviously you want to get quarrelers, but you want to get a room marcher, then inspiring presence, then free point and tactician for to benefit your quarrelers. Even if you start out as Forgrim, who may be uh, getting a lot of warriors early on, it's not necessarily worth it to get a lot of points in Axe Lord, as far as I see it. Eventually, later on, yes but not early on. Besides, Axelord is not going to benefit some of the higher tier uh, units that uh, you may use, um, like for instance, Hammerers or more likely Iron Breakers. In fact, I would dare say that uh, if you're not planning on using a lot of uh, Warriors, don't spend any point in this. Instead, spend three points in Acticians, one point in Inspiring Presence, one point in Rune Marcher, then save points to get the special skill tree that every Legendary Lord has. For a regular Lord, yeah, you can spend it, or you can get, uh, or you can start buffing up their own personal combat ability. Obstinacy uh, is also something very important because it helps a Vigor Lost reduction, so I would certainly prioritize that as well. Uh, getting that though if you're for your legendary lord just being able to get the uh, special skill tree is going to be quite crucial especially if you're playing in Belagar, that global recruitment benefit is pretty goddamn sweet as well as some other uh benefits for uh for your units like he buffs rangers by quite a fair amount by the way and that's what uh, you should focus on. Like, if I look at a lord, a regular lord, I've gotten tactician, inspiring presence, thunderer, as well to buff the artillery rally, and then I've started buffing his uh, his personal melee combat ability with the same focus as with fanes, which is basically hard to hit, scarred veteran, then blade shield uh, over here, then obstinacy, lord of the depths. Uh, in the lower tree over here. You may benefit a bit from getting Mason, though it's only for uh, capital buildings. I might prefer, you might prefer if you're dealing with a lot of corruption, which I am here, uh, to get Pure Beard, maybe a point in Mason, or maybe four, three points in Mason's, uh, Mason, one point in Pure Beard. I don't find Wall Breaker to be all that worth it, or Minor Instinct to necessarily be all that worth it, though it could help you if you're dealing with a lot of underway movement. But one of the things that you will want to get, without a doubt, um, is to eventually get uh, Iron Weld and then more crucially, Inspirational Leader 
for the casualty replenishment and then to get inquiring mind now i would generally say that you should focus on the combat ability the army abilities of a lord before you start focusing on the blue line that's how i personally view it uh, when it comes down to it now finally with heroes and lords here's something that actually is very relevant for your campaign Dwarves don't have the best economy. They're okay, but they suffer because the poor growth screws them over in their economy as well. Because if they can't get their settlement to a higher level, they're going to have unlimited economy, so limited armies. But there is a way to help with that. There is the ancestral blood on lords and rune lords. And what this does, what the ancestral blood Grugni does is two things, two crucial things. One is it gives you 5% research, and two, it gives you a minus 15% construction cost for all buildings in the local region. Now, I believe this stacks. So, if you can get Grugni, uh, that's actually pretty great. Now, I personally prefer Rune Lords, but in this campaign, I've actually gotten it on quite a few Lords. Like, if I look at him, I believe he has it. Yes, he does have it other lords like for instance in this rune lord that i just recruited here to keep skaven blight alive also have it has it if you're wondering how i took skaven blight for from um from ikiklaw the answer to that question is well he and sartosa started the war and then he and then ikiklaw declared war on me and i wiped his army out and i was like ooh, skaven blight is vulnerable but he still got he still has settlements over here so he's launching constant attacks against my territory i think he might have a settlement he might have a settlement over here or something along those lines i i don't know um but he he is launching constant attacks on my territory generally with slaves and i just keep wiping them out without resolve on the highest difficulty of the game it's kind of ridiculous um but he has grugni and that means uh construction cost is going down like you can use this to reduce the construction cost in your settlements by quite a lot and the best part is that you can get the on heroes as well so you can get past the bloat over here faster you can get past you can get the research that you need you can get structures much fa uh, much cheaper and money for structures is always very welcome in any um in any cam campaign you get a significant cost reduction. And it's something you should take advantage of. Like, you need to take advantage of everything that's given to you because you're going to need it. You're not playing something like the Greenskins where you can YOLO half the campaign and still win with ease. You actually need to play properly. This campaign here, for instance, that I've been playing, honestly, like, it's only turn 43 and I feel like I've been through 200 turns or more already in this campaign. It's been that kind of adventure. And honestly, it's gotten exceptionally well. Don't get me wrong on that. I've won a lot, but... Damn, it does feel exhausting playing the dwarves just because of all the issues that they do have with them. Now, finally, I do want to turn the discussion to mods. But before I do that, I do want to answer a question that quite a few people ask me, actually, with regards to dwarves. Uh, and that is, what quarrelers should you take? Well, here's the... Here's a perspective. Quarrelers with great, with regular quarrelers have a bronze shield. What that means is 35% of, or 20%, sorry, of all um, missile fire will be blocked from the front. Quarrelers with great weapons don't have that bronze shield, so they don't have that blocking chance, but instead they get armor piercing with their melee weapons. So what that really means is that quarrelers with great weapons are more effective in melee, Regular quarrelers are more effective at ranged, or against dealing with ranged units. Outside of that, they're pretty much the same. Uh, Cost-wise, they're effectively the same, though quarrelers with gray weapons are just a bit more expensive, but outside of that, pretty much the same unit. I prefer a combination of both these units because of the versatility that brings to your army. Like, you do want a stronger melee line, but you also want a stronger range line, dependent on the situation. Depends on what you're dealing with. You will be fighting a lot of greenskins, and greenskins have both good melee and good range. They're pretty scary to deal with. Also, it's worth saying for me that when you're dealing with the post-battle options and the choices that you do have, you get a choice between either oath gold or drinking to get uh, victory. Like you can ransom the captives or execute the captives, depending on what you get for more oath gold and treasury, or getting drink to victory. Now, here's how to view this. If you are 
fighting in, re in a province that you're taking over, getting this at least once is worth it. That growth, the income, the control is going to be extremely important for your early takeover of a province. If you can get this multiple times, that's even better. But of course, when it comes to executing or ransoming captives, that's also important, especially if certain battles and some can give you an enormous amount of gold and or treasure. Now, here, for instance, I will go with the control. One rug. We're saying a bit that... Uh, we're, we're saying a bit when it comes to this. If a garrison gets attacked, that... Uh, a garrison won't get uh, this be benefit, I believe. Uh, so, uh, when it comes to a garrison, you if a garrison gets attacked and the garrison beats it back, uh, then you pretty much want to always go for the Oath Gold. Unless there's a Lord in that garrison, in which case you can get the growth and control benefit. Now, as for Salman's post-battle options, well, that, I would say, depends on the Salman. For instance, over here, Mount Silver Spear is a tier 3 settlement. So if I sack it, right, which is generally what I do if I was playing virtually any other faction, if I sack it, I do gain a lot of money. But always keep in mind the poor growth that dwarf settlements do have. So if you loot and occupy it, yes, you're going to lose a lot in terms of the conquest penalty. But the level of the settlement won't go down by two. Because if you sack it, the sacking itself reduces the level by one. And the occupation reduces the level by one as well. So you're losing two levels uh, as well. Always be something, uh, some things to bear in mind when you're dealing with, uh, with the dwarves over here. With post-battle options. Now mod-wise, there are a few. And I will list all of them in the description of this video. But some are fairly basic stuff like better camera, mod, toggle fog of war, those kind of things. But there are some important, especially for the dwarves, in terms of how they impact their campaign. Will these make your campaign easier? Well, I would use the term less miserable, considering the state of affairs of the dwarves in general in Warhammer 3. One of the important mods for the dwarves is the removal of the public order penalty. If you're playing on any decent difficulty, and especially a legendary, you're going to suffer a minus 8 public order or control penalty, just because you're playing the game. Add to that uh, the, uh, the loss of control from collected income, minus 4, so you're looking at a control issue of minus 12. Now, for most factions, this isn't actually too big of an issue. For the dwarves, with their poor control and ergo poor growth it is a major issue more so the growth than the actual control what do you care if uh, you lose control because um, ultimately you're start going to start getting some benefits in control before rebellions happen rebellions are actually a bit uh, pretty rare in warhammer 3 i've only seen them playing as skaven and that's because skaven get a significant amount of control penalty when they take over a settlement outside of that not really um, Ready. And of course, that's on top. Th that's before you add in the corruption issues, the conquest issues. Yeah, dwarfs absolutely need some help with that. It wouldn't be too bad if you had uh, good good growth, but you don't. So this is a way to help with that by dealing with the control issue. It also helps if you're playing a legendary lord that doesn't have two. Uh, too many problems when it comes to grudges. Surprisingly, Belagar with 2.2 is actually in the best spot, uh, I believe, when it comes to, uh, to this. That and Grom Brindle, because his initial starting grudges are not going to be worth on the me uh, a lot on the meter, and grudges grow very, very slowly. The second mod uh, to talk about is the Warband Upgrade mod. This can affect allied recruitment as well, not just your own recruitment. But basically, it gives you the same upgrade system that the Warriors of Chaos have received since uh, since the launch uh, since the launch of Warhammer Free. Gives it makes it available for your faction. 
Now it has some downsides. It's not just like completely on the upside. You're spending unit ranks, quite a few of them, in order to upgrade uh, these units. And obviously the upkeep of these units is going to be higher. Like Coraler, for instance, is 167. Uh, Ranger with Grey Weapon is 163, fair enough. But the Bugman Ranger is worth a bit more. So if I upgrade it over there, and I can because I have enough unit ranks, I'm obviously going to lose a lot of unit ranks, but that might absolutely uh, be worth it. Just bear in mind, there are downsides, substantial ones at that, and it is going to put a strain on your already weak economy. But the benefit of it is you no longer have to go back to settlements or just recruit a lord uh, for the sake of being able to get um, uh, for, uh, for the sake of just being able uh, to get the higher tier units it makes the flow of campaigns much better you never want to stop in a campaign uh, though with Belagar again this is a less of an issue because of the major benefit he gets in terms of global recruitment for his entire faction but yeah you avoid having to spend some money but again trade-offs right there's a, there's a bunch of trade-offs when it comes to warband recruitment. The third is craftable casualty replenishment. This is purely for dwarves, and what it does is you it creates an item in the banner runes that gives you 14% casualty replenishment. This does cost 200 of gold. You're not getting this for free. And 200 of gold is a fair amount, actually. It's a fairly hefty amount uh, to require. But what this does is it gives you an, a priest item, maybe it should be named a brewmaster either way, uh, that gives you 40% casualty replenishment to help you out in an immense way with the deficiency that dwarves do have yes. when it comes to casualty replenishment. It isn't going to be as much as the, as the greenskins, by the, uh, as high as the greenskins can potentially get, though it is uh, higher than what they might get by uh, default. But you are taking up an ancillary slot with it. So there are cons. There's not just pure benefits when it comes to that. Like I would say these three months, public order, uh, ca craft uh, craftable casualty replenishment, and the warband upgrade do help make the dwarf campaign a lot better than it is by default. Of of all of them, I would actually say the public order one is uh, is the most important. And yeah, I achieved my short victory campaign condition because I fly finally wiped out Clan Moors over here. And that is it. Uh, obviously, there are some other mods available as well, but I don't want anything too game-changing. I do want to keep in the spirit of the vanilla game. Like, obviously, there's you know Radius and SFO and all that kind of stuff if you want to try it out. But if you want to play basically the vanilla game Zorica. with some tweaks, the list of mods that I have will allow you to do that. Well, the most substantial change, I guess, in the way the game is played is obviously the change uh, to recruitment or to upgrades. But honestly, it's not like you're not going to try and get better units. It just makes the process better being able to take the units that you already have and upgrading them. Also, of course, one button respec. That's always worth it. Always pr a pretty good mod uh, to have. Anyway. Christine here signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, enable notifications, and I'll see you next time.